is born. Lord, we praise you for these words. Lord, not just because they are words, but because we know it. We feel it in our hearts. Lord, we ask this morning as we enter into this time of worship, Lord, that those words would swell within us. That it would become a cry that we cannot contain. Lord, that your spirit would be upon this place and this hour and us in such a way. Lord, that when we leave this place, we cannot hold it in. But to proclaim, Lord, that you are here. So we praise you this morning, for you are Emmanuel, God, with us. Lord, as we enter worship, let it be the cry of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will read responsibly with me, the call to worship in your own worship. I'll read the light print if you will read the bold with me. All God's people, boys and girls, Women, men, come worship. Shepherds, magi, saints, and angels, come worship. All who need the Savior, all who long for comfort, come worship. Come and worship Christ, the newborn King. Now, what I need to know 
is which of these four things does not fit with the Bible verse I'm getting ready to tell you? Well, how do you know I haven't told you the Bible verse? <laughs> Taking a guess. You say, why do you say the tambourine doesn't fit? Because it might Oh, the other stuff doesn't line up. Okay. All right, Sarah, we'll turn it, we'll turn it off. I don't know, it's broken. <laughs> I said, no, I don't need you to fix it. I need a lot of things I need. But you to fix it is not what I'm Here we go. How about that? Okay, all right. Now it's not lit up. All right? But you know what? You were right. Yeah. You were right. And here's the Bible passage. The, the, the Bible, now the way it belongs, and I'll tell you why. The, the Bible passage is this. It's a verse in Luke. And it's Luke 2.52. And it says, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. God and man. Okay? People ask me a lot. They say, why doesn't it tell me in the Bible what Jesus did when he was a child? There's no stories about him not growing up as a child or as a teenager. And I tell them, yeah, it does tell us. It tells us in Luke 2.52 that Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature favor with God and man. So he got, he got smarter when he read the Bible. He got stronger when he exercised like all children do. And, and he increased in his favor with God and man, his spirit by, by well, by, by, learning, by learning about his father and sharing that with other people. So he got closer to other people and he got closer to his father. And see, that's the same thing with us. The Bible says we were created in God's image, and what that means is we were created mind, body, and soul, just like Jesus. Mind, body, and soul. So our lesson from that is you keep reading God's Word, okay? Read the Bible. Have mom and dad read the Bible with you, all right? Keep, keep growing and get stronger physically, and then keep growing in your spirit by getting to know other people and getting to know God better. Is that a good plan? Yeah. That's a real good plan, isn't it? That's a good plan for life. Let's pray and ask for God's help, okay? Let's pray again. Dear Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for these precious children. I pray that you would be with them as they continue to grow in mind, body, and spirit. God, we thank you for the parents. We thank you for this church. Uh, as we, as a group, as a body, uh, help them grow closer to you and to each other. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you all later. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm going to put this right back in the box, okay? There you go. And now I am Christmas. I was Jeff, now I am Christmas. Okay? Um, in, in our scripture reading today, I'm going to change it up a little bit. The, uh, the passage that's listed is one we were going to read, and then as I began looking at the lecture, passages for today, for today, there is a passage in Psalms that was listed among the lectionary that I would really like to read to you. So I'm going to do this. We'll change it up. Uh, we read John 1 on Christmas Eve, and, and so we're going to change it up and go with Psalm 148. So if you have the Bible, you'd like to turn with us, Psalm kind of in the middle of the, of the Bible there, you can turn with me to Psalm 148. Uh, it's a psalm of praise, and I think it's very appropriate uh, for this morning. Psalm 148, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights above, praise him all his angels, praise him all his heavenly hosts, praise him sun and moon, praise him all you shining stars, praise him to the highest heavens and waters below the skies, let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created, he set them in place forever and ever and he gave a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding, you mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. 
He has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all his saints of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. Let's go in our hearts in prayer together. <coughs> Gracious Father, we do come as your children. Come as your children who are seeking to grow in our knowledge of you, in our fellowship with one another. And God, we pray that as we praise you, that you would teach us that you would correct us through your word, through what you lay on our hearts as we worship you and as we open ourselves to you. God, we thank you for these precious children because they are a constant reminder to us that all of us should have that kind of open, inquisitive spirit to know more about you and what you desire for us. God, we pray we would never get stagnant, we would never get to the point where we feel like we know everything that we need to know about our lives and who you are and who we are in relationship to you. Help us to constantly strive to know you more, to serve you more completely. And God, as we serve you, we know that in our midst there are people that are hurting, loved ones that have been lost. Father, did so many aches and pains that come from just living life here on this earth. But we know that you have promised that even in those circumstances, that you're with us, that you walk with us, that your presence empowers us and gives us strength for the day. We thank you for that. And we pray that as we minister to each other, that you would continue to guide us, encourage us, give us your strength and wisdom. For it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. <laughs>
to, beginning in verse 41, for those that were here last week, you'll be proud that I'm actually preaching passages as listeners. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't change my mind this week. We're, we're in Luke chapter 2, verse 41, and we'll read to that verse that I read to you according to the children a few minutes ago. Beginning in verse 41, every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been searching anxiously. For you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Again, Mary is pondering. She's treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and men. Before we go a whole lot further, I want to uh, I want to show you a book uh, because I got a lot of questions a couple weeks ago when we were talking about different uh, references to material, and I want to show you one that I think you would really enjoy. Again, uh, it's from a professor of mine, head of Wake Forest, Charles Tower, and it's part of a series. The series of the commentaries are called Reading. And then it'll have the book of the Bible. So in this particular case, reading Luke, which along with David Sharp and his comments, Dr. Talbot's remarks and reading Luke kind of fashion uh, today's sermon and that helped to organize my thoughts. But there's a whole series of these reading commentaries. And the advantage of this particular line of commentary is it's less academic. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in a good way. It's more conversational. It's, it's, it's a lot less technical and it's a lot more application. So if you're looking for an alternative to a regular commentary that you might see in an academic setting, I highly recommend the reading series. So I want to put that in there. Now let's talk about the passage of scripture that we've just read. But, but let me give you a little bit of background. You remember last spring, I think it was, we did a series on Wednesday nights talking about the Jewish festival, the great Jewish celebrations. Uh, and in that study, we learned that the festival of Passover was really one of the big three, in terms of the, the ones that, that really, that, that they held the highest. It was Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And, and in those particular uh, festivals, the Jewish people commemorated certain events that had happened in their history. Now, Passover, you'll remember, was the celebration of the night of the angel of the death, the angel of death passed over the homes of the Israelites who had put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. Remember that as they were trying to escape Egyptian captivity? Your head's this way, do you remember that? Okay, that's what Passover celebrates. Now, the, the context here is the people, the parents are all going to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. Now, along with all the great throngs of pilgrims who were making this journey along with Mary and Joseph and their friends, the backdrop of Passover celebration Included a lot of trappings. Okay, you had the entrepreneurs that were out there. They were selling stuff. You had had merchants selling all kinds of wares, and, and then you had those who were offering lodging uh, to travelers. So there would have been a lot of commotion, a lot of people in the streets, a lot of hustle and bustle, a lot of things to see and do. You know, you had the sights, the sounds, the colors, the smells, the taste that would have filled the air, and, and all those who were present. And, and it was quite an exciting time. It was a lot more exciting than village life in Nazareth, okay? So, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was something special. It was something really kind of a sensory overload. Uh, we use the, the, 
the illustration of the nine o'clock service, kind of like taking taking someone out of a, a, a western rural city and drop them in the middle of New York City. I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on, and there, there was no doubt a lot of young people present, children as well as teenagers. Now, Jesus was very human. He was fully God, fully man. He was very human. He was a, he was a 12-year-old boy, and no doubt he wanted to, to experience these things as well. He was probably an outgoing kind of guy. We read from Scripture, he had a good sense of humor, very gregarious. People liked to be around him. He was probably in the streets talking with friends, just enjoying this whole experience. So you can imagine that he wanted to meet other people. He wanted to explore all these things that were going on, perhaps checking in with mom, dad from time to time. You know, he was, he was allowed to venture away as long as they kind of knew his general whereabouts. That was due to his age. He was 12 years old. At age 13, he became a part of the religious community proper. He was almost a man, according to their culture. So at age 12, he was given some latitude. All right, he was some latitude. He would not be expected to be with his parents all the time. You know, in addition to that, you had the trip to and from Jerusalem. And you had, it was customary for the women and the children to kind of be in the front of the crowd. And then you had the men in the back. That was for protection. Or so they said, it might have been a little man talking on back there too. We don't know. But the men were in the back. The women and the children were in the front. Now, given his age, he probably could have gone either way. Maybe talking with the men for a little while and then going up and seeing one mom and and, and the other children were doing it. And so it's, it's quite reasonable that it could be assumed by either parent that he was with the other one at any given time. Given the social norms, given their pattern, it was quite understandable. And it was in this delicate balance, this dance of, of freedom and security, that Jesus <coughs> turns up missing. Now, parents, has it ever happened to you? Have you ever temporarily lost your child? You're in a, in a crowd, maybe a grocery store or a ball game or something else, but there's a lot of people, and all of a sudden you turn and your child is not there. It feels like your heart drops down here somewhere. It is a terrifying feeling. We know that feeling. My wife and I know that feeling. Poor Ashley, I have to tell us. But, but when she was a little smart, she was about this high, we were in Bush Gardens. And we were in the children's area, which only had one way in and one way out. And, and we pretty well wrapped up, or so we thought, our activities in this area. And saw her leg over her hand for a split second to pick up something, turn back around, and now she's gone. She's gone. Those of you who remember her in her younger years around the church, you do not see that as surprising. But, but she was gone, and because there was only one way in, I immediately bolted for that entrance, knowing that, you know, you just had to be there in case she tried to leave or somebody tried to leave with her. And I screamed at Carson, go find your sister. So he took off. The father goes the other way. And it was only two or three minutes before I saw him waving at me again, as she had over and splashing in the, where the water sheets up through the sidewalk. She was over just merrily, you know, playing in the water. And we found her, but for those two or three minutes, it was terror. Talk about an adrenaline rush. It was absolute terror. And, and every time I see these Amber Alerts, or I get an alert on my phone that, that gives an Amber Alert, that even though it's not my child, I still, my heart beats for the parents of the child that's missing. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. I can't what Mary and Joseph were going through. And, and I would fully suspect that the human response was the same in their day as it is now, even though their community was probably a lot safer than ours, truth be told. The Bible tells us that they found him after the third day. I went through about three minutes. They went through at least three days, and I'll say at least, for just, just a moment I'll explain this. It, it's really not absolutely clear whether the scenario includes the days of travel to get back to Jerusalem. If so, then Joseph and Mary kind of first looked, Scripture tells us they looked among, talked among the family, the extended friend, have you seen Jesus, have you seen Jesus, have you seen where he went? You know, they already traveled a day's distance from Jerusalem. 
So it took them a day to get back to Jerusalem. Most likely the third day was spent looking for their son. However, the biblical account as it's here, the language is such that it could be saying that it took three days from the time that they arrived back in Jerusalem. Can you imagine that? Three days looking for But whether it was a day or whether it was three days, can you imagine their anxiety? We've lost the Son of God. What, are you kidding me? And, and now Mary and Joseph, they, they know. They, they know and they knew that their son was unique. They understood that. That God had given him to them for a very special purpose. But they, they, that did not prevent them from fearing for his safety. He's 12 years old. They didn't know when this unique mission would actually start to take effect and, and make itself known. They, they didn't have a, a, a playlist of how it was going to all work itself out. So it was a it, it terribly anxious time. And I, I got to, as I read it, it doesn't give a lot of detail. I wonder where they went. Look, I mean, it says they asked them on their family and friends, but then they went back to Jerusalem. Where did they go in Jerusalem? Looking for them. I would suspect that they probably checked the marketplace. You know where all the excitement was? Thinking, well, maybe he stayed with some of his buddies. They probably looked in the shops there, the merchants, maybe the homes of friends and acquaintances that they had in Jerusalem, maybe where they had spent the night. You know, and after agonizing hours had passed, they finally looked in the right place. They found him in the temple. <laughs> and they were amazed, astonished. Whatever words you want to put in there. Relieved is probably the word I want to put in. They were amazed. And upon questioning him, they, no doubt they were relieved and they, they were upset. And yet they were so relieved, the upset didn't matter at that point. But, but they were even more amazed at Jesus' response to them. He reminded them, my dad, here's my life's mission. And by the way, this is the logical place that I would be. Well, of course. Every 12-year-old boy wants to hang in the temple, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Of course that's where he was. The other parents go, really? Wow. You know, and it seemed to Mary and Joseph, you know, as they're looking around, they're, they're looking many other places before they try the temple. And Jesus is saying to them, it should have been the first place. <laughs> Mary and Joseph had temporarily lost something that was very precious to them. And I read in this story a powerful analogy when we connect it to our own life. Think about it. When we lose something in our life, something that's important to us, whether it's love or wealth or, or happiness or beauty or security or peace of mind, anytime we lose those things, we can be tempted to search in all the wrong places like the bad country song said, okay? We look in all the wrong places. Many people have looked for their salvation in those wrong places. Have you thought about that? They look for their salvation in the wrong places. Some look to the marketplace. The commotion, the bright lights, the sparkly tambourine. They, they look at all of this stuff. They look at the world of things and, and money and possessions. The market actually advertises itself as a place where, where you can purchase anything that will make you happy and perfect. If you don't believe me, look at the Amazon box. Have you ever noticed that on the Amazon box? What is that? It's a smile. The implication being, if you buy this, you will be happy. Yeah. You'll be happy. You'll never look at the Amazon box the same way anyway. <laughs> That's the first thing you'll see from now on. But the idea is just buy this. Buy this toothpaste and you'll get the perfect smile. Or buy these clothes that will attract the man and woman of your dreams. Or live here for absolutely the best life you can imagine. Furthermore, people make these exorbitant fees for cosmetic surgeries, making them look younger. The implication being that youth makes you more happy. Yeah. More happy. So, so just as Mary and Joseph may have looked in homes to find what they were looking for, sometimes we do the same thing too. It's not just in the marketplace. It's even in homes. 
And sometimes we are so disillusioned in our own home that we start looking at other people's homes, wanting what they have in their homes. And I'm not just talking about furniture. Sometimes we want somebody else's wife or we want somebody else's husband because we think that will fix what's wrong with our marriage. And Solomon warned against this folly in Proverbs chapter 5, verses 15 to 23, and I invite you to read that when you go home. We won't take the time to do it now. But Solomon says, uh-uh, it doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. It's not always that you need something else. Sometimes it's a condition of the heart. Yeah, you do need something else, but it's not something physical. It's the presence of God. And, and Jesus' response to his parents is the same response that he gives us today for those who are looking for Christ's presence today. In essence, he says, it's not difficult to find. He says, I am in the temple of your heart. For those who have already invited Christ into your life, we sometimes forget that Christ is close by. He's right here. He walks with us daily. He's constantly here. His presence is always with us. And we have to remember the words of 1 John 4, 4 and claim them as truth for ourselves. When it says, for the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. You say, why is that so important? Well, it's because the world would like to take and can take away our peace, our sense of stability, if we allow it to happen. And, and we can respond without looking in the right places for sustenance and spiritual reunion. We can. But when life tosses us around and we lose sight of the happiness and joy, we have to remember Jesus' words. Jesus said in John 16, verse 33, I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world, you face persecution. <laughs> but take courage. I have conquered the world. Jesus is saying, no matter what your fears, no matter what your challenge, no matter what your anxiety, I have already conquered it. Now claim it. <clears throat> I've conquered it. You claim it because I live within you. So as we look at the new year, and the Mayan calendar scare is behind us now, <laughs> what, whatever new challenges we may face, whatever new doubts, whatever may, may face, whatever new fears that we may have both now and, and in the future, know that Christ is ever present. God is with us. His presence is with us in the temple of our soul. We need not go looking because we know he's there. He's not lost. He's right where he belongs. And he's there to give us the resources of wisdom, and hope, peace, and joy, unconditional love, grace, mercy, and power for living. Praise God. Let's thank him. Let's pray again. Gracious Father, we, we praise you for who you are. And we thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the incredible stories that you've given us in your word to teach us. To teach us about the life of your son here on earth, but also to teach us about what our lives should be like here on earth. Help us to learn by example. Help us to learn through your teaching so that we can be more and more like your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. I invite you today, if you do not know the Savior, if you do not have Jesus ever present in your life, this is the day to get that settled. We're going to stand and sing in just a moment. I invite you to come speak with me. I'll be glad to share with you how you can pray to receive Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. If you'd rather not do it this morning, call me this week. I'll be glad to talk with you, meet you wherever you would like to, and we'll talk about you that square away. If you're here this morning and say, Ray, I, I am a believer. I'm just not living like it. For some reason, I'm just not feeling that power within my life. I'll be glad to pray with you. You can certainly settle down where you are, speak with God where you are, and open your heart to Him uh, where you are. But I, again, I'll be glad to speak with you if you'd like to. Uh, if you're here and you'd like to be a part of this church by formal membership, 
Uh, there's a lot of ways we proceed. We'll probably glad to talk with you about that. Whatever your decision is, I invite you to make that up stand and sing together. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 